Hello, and welcome to the second of today's Women in IT panel presentations, A New Innovation, A Fresh Look at Mainframe Inclusion, Mentorship, and Innovation. My name is Andrea Zobins, and on behalf of SHARE, I would like to thank you for joining us today. I will now turn the webcast over to Lisa and our panelists. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us. Sorry we were a little late, had some technical challenges, but we're all here and really are appreciative that you're here as well. Um, there is no debate that incredible innovation drives the mainframe industry, but today we are looking at innovation differently. We're asking a new question. Are we fully deploying that same world-class creativity and problem solving to the spectrum of needs in the industry beyond products and services like the skills gap, diversity, inclusion, and mentorship. My name is Lisa Wood, Chief Marketing Officer of Virtual Z Computing, and it is my pleasure to welcome you and moderate today's panel. As the first women-owned ISV in the history of the mainframe, Virtual Z is committed to gender and racial diversity on the platform like many companies in the space and certainly the companies represented today on the panel. We are grateful to share for starting the Women in IT initiative to amplify leadership of all voices and expertise on the platform. Today's panelists are uniquely qualified on the topics of innovation and inclusion, and you are in for a treat. We have two innovation experts, Tyler King with IBM, Dr. Gloria Chance, CEO of the Musai Group, and three experts who run programs who bring new talent to the mainframe industry, literally shaping the demographics of the talent pool now and into the future. Deb Carbo with Broadcom, Katie Branch with Insono, and Melissa Sassi with IBM. Our plan today is to examine some of the mainframe progress and programs in place now to increase diversity and to discuss applying innovation to accelerate our path forward. So let's get started. Tyler, innovation is at the center of your work as design lead, design thinking leader, and a researcher at IBM. You use a unique method to unlock innovation called design thinking, and you train teams on this methodology. What is design thinking and why is it valuable in our work to increase diversity on the mainframe? Hi, um, so I'm Tyler. Uh, I work at IBM. I'm a designer. Uh, so at IBM, we have our own unique brand of uh, design thinking because we didn't make up design thinking. It's an industry-wide technique. Um, but our brand is called Enterprise Design Thinking. It's designed to uniquely scale um, because IBM's a huge company. We have to scale. Um, but the really big principles of design thinking pretty much wherever you are in the industry are a focus on user outcomes. So focusing on the people that are literally using our products and offerings or solutions, uh, restless reinvention. So treating everything like a prototype and diverse empowered teams, not just having homogenous teams, uh, a bunch of the same people that, you know, look and sound and act and believe the same things put together in a room because we're not going to innovate that way. We're not going to challenge each other that way. And design thinking is a really great tool for innovation and to grow diversity and inclusion and empowerment, especially in the mainframe space, because at the center, at the core of everything we do at design thinking is empathy. Design thinking is literally just human centered problem solving. So we really want to have empathy uh, for the people that we are creating for. So if we treat everything like a prototype, like I said, and we approach problems with empathy, so problems like, uh, you know, lack of diversity in our hiring pipeline, for example, or, you know, lack of empowerment into, in our mainframe space. Um, if we treat everything like a prototype and we're not falling in love with old ways of doing things, we're already taking the first step in a really great way um, and treating things like they're meant to be broken. Um, so we want to change and drive for empowerment through, you know, empathy, through co-creation, and through research. So data-backed decision-making with a human-centered focus. And it all comes down to acting with a purpose. So that's what design thinking is all about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, I think that foundation is going to be important for us moving the conversation forward today. And with that, Deb, let's talk about the innovative skills development program you lead at Broadcom, where trained people educated at Broadcom are placed into mainframe jobs with clients. How did you come up with the idea and how did you design Broadcom's mainframe vitality program? Thank you so much. I really am looking at what Tyler said and that truly resonates with us. 
at Broadcom, we meet with our clients regularly and we have opportunities to work through the problems that they're having. And for each of the meetings that we set up, we have a mainframe strategic advisory council and we do things at SHARE and other large events and now virtually. Each time we asked, let's prioritize the issues that we have in the market, skills landed in the top three every time. The skills gap is growing and our customers that use the mainframe and have positions to staff struggle to find the right talent or any talent in certain cases. So our goals were pretty clear and, and we sat down with a sub team to work through these, these um, methods, these design thinking methods such as empathy mapping and journey maps and working through what the what ifs scenarios to see could we design something new that doesn't exist, something that would really solve the problem, that would truly bring the outcome that's needed, which is talent with mainframe skills readily available to hire. And we did that, in fact, um, with this Vitality program that we developed at Broadcom, it was with direct customer feedback and a feedback cycle and loop as we uh, rolled the program out. We've actually had three semesters or, or cohorts go through the program. We've got 30 people in this program. And what we offered to do is think about barriers. What are the barriers? Oh, well, we have to hire degreed people in a specific degree area. Oh, we must have people in our city and our location. Remote work is not allowed. Those kinds of things. Or, oh my goodness, our talent uh, that has been in place for 30 years is retiring and I can't hire anybody until that person leaves because I don't have the head count. Mm -hmm. So we offer to carry the burden at Broadcom. We'll carry a resource up to a year hire the right people or even offer our own and say, hey, you know, these people are talented in mainframe. Let's make it easier for you. Hire them. And we created this program that brings early career individuals with some maturity and experience from all different backgrounds. And we train them at our expense. And we used our education programs and used our mainframe experts, the patent holders for mainframe products. And we developed a program of training followed by mentorship and residency, which means on-site, working with your soon-to-retired talent. And the program, again, was born through a design thinking activity, and we're, we're quite proud of it. Well, thank you, Deb. Thank you for giving us also the tie-in to how design thinking influenced your program. Now, I'll go to you, Dr. Chance. As a mindset psychologist, innovation, and creativity expert, you currently advise companies today on innovation, technology transformation, and change. Can you tell us specifically how creativity can be used to broaden inclusion for women and people of color? Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, creativity can be used to broaden inclusion for all of us because what I learned after being a creative person and then going to get my doctorate is that creativity resides in all of us through our thinking and imagination. So it is a process that can be trained. But diversity and inclusion is important, and here's why. We all know that demographics are changing and shifting, which, which is making it imperative for our product development to support the consumers who will use the products. But more than that, different lifestyles and different backgrounds challenge each other more. And so diversity creates dissent, and we need that for creativity. Without deep inquiry, some of the things that Tyler mentioned, there are no breakthroughs. We keep creating the same old sausage over and over again. And so a couple of ways that creativity can be used to broaden inclusion, I, I believe, Deb, you mentioned a, a program that I, I just, I love it. And one of the things that I do with organizations is we create these creative problem solving circles, which um, it, it organically uh, combines the wisdom of leaders while leveraging the imagination and knowledge of employees at all levels to solve a problem creatively. Because we all know what it's like to have an executive go, oh, we're going to do this. And then people down the line go, what? 
And so this is an opportunity of people to engage in a specific way in a mentorship, apprenticeship-like engagement, but everyone's mentoring everyone, including the executive leaders being mentored. And that's how we get creative thinking going. And it actually becomes contagious if that leader um, executes in a way that makes people know that it's okay to be in a conversation with a leader and to have dissent or disagree. Also, the importance of looking at data differently. Um, you know, we look at hard data like sales and costs, but what about systems thinking? We all do this when we design computer systems, but what if we did this when we developed diversity programs? So we could look and see what we developed. Does the system we developed tie back into the broader system within a feedback loop that creates a difference? But that requires that we have to have qualitative data. We have to have data that shows improvement, and we're not good at doing that. Um, Tyler, probably as a researcher in the work that you do in design thinking, you understand how to do that. We got to pull the data together. Um, and finally, my, my last point on this is that this requires that we all increase our creative minds, our creative thinking, which research says we only use about 20% of our creative minds. Okay, we've got, we've got a bit of work to do if it's only 20%. So hopefully, hopefully in this session, we'll be learning some ideas that we can all take away uh, to help improve our opportunities with creativity, which in this conversation directly relates to our uh, abilities with diversity and inclusion. So thank you, Dr. Chance. Katie, at Insono, you are manager of mainframe systems and development, but also head of Insono's mainframe academy. What is the mainframe academy? And what are some of the creative avenues you've taken to broaden your pool of candidates outside of the expected new college graduate arena? Thank you, Lisa. That's an excellent question. Kind of, I'll, uh, you know, there will be some similarities to the program that Deb talked about earlier. And I absolutely agree. I'm looking forward to taking away a lot of design thinking tips from this uh, panel discussion today. But uh, what we have, what Mainframe Academy is, is in Sonos comprehensive training uh, program for mainframe technologies. It goes across entry to intermediate and advanced level uh, training. Um, our training, we have uh, our own uh, in-house online e-learning system. Uh, we also have hands-on training, which is probably the most critical part of this with uh, expert leading uh, mainframe uh, individuals, our SMEs as we call them, uh, that offer a ton of wealth. And so we take advantage of that as often as we possibly can. Um, you know, two things that kind of motivated us, right, which is the maturing uh, mainframe workforce. Uh, everyone knows that uh, mainframes have been around a long time. So we are looking to, uh, in addition to that, we are looking to aspire and encourage Encourage new and up-and-coming professionals to take a closer look at this unique space in IT. Um, you know, it comes with a uh, unique liking, but it has a wonderful opportunity for advancement. It's a very lucrative field, and we like to try and share that, again, with our new and up-and-coming IT professionals. My particular focus is around the entry level area of this program, and we call this the apprenticeship. It starts off with an internship that we offer once a year each summer. And um, within that, it includes a multitude, again, of technical training, but also soft skills and business skills, uh, a little bit of project management, uh, other real world tips that individuals can take with them, no matter where they land in their career path. So, you know, it's a two way street. We're wanting to give them something while also encouraging them to consider giving back uh, to us in some way. To answer your question about kind of what are we doing to broaden our spectrum, right? To look differently at our candidacy pool. That was really critical. I quickly realized in order to address this, we genuinely had to look at the root of, of the, 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 the root cause, if you will. And so in taking a closer look at our recruiting efforts, I quickly realized that four year degrees, while they are very successful, they've been proven to be very successful, uh, it became evident that it really did limit our resource pool. Uh, to a certain type of individual. And many of our subject matter experts do not hold four-year degrees, those that are in mainframe. Uh, and they are some of the most talented uh, individuals that I've ever met. So uh, again, mainframe is a very unique area of IT and it has the ability to capture the interest 
of highly qualified candidates outside of the college campus. Uh, so with that said, I first wanted to have a human element in our interaction, right? Trying to kind of steer away a little bit from the automated resume process, ensure that we were attending job fairs across the board and actually having our hands and our faces in the selection process. Um, as far as the avenues that we decided to take, uh, we're talking about two-year degree colleges, uh, junior colleges, uh, IT uh, programs that offer IT certificates, military, uh, veterans, all of these avenues offer a wealth of valuable um, skill sets, uh, even beyond technical skill sets, right? We're looking at individuals who um, um, bring the unique value in regards to maybe having more life or work experience, bringing a level of maturity uh, a commitment that you may not always find uh, in someone, a fresh graduate from college. So we wanted to mix that up. Um, another thing that I wanted to kind of hit on was that we did all of this without targeting necessarily gender or race. Just by broadening our avenues, we brought in a, a extreme diverse group of individuals to select from just by making those simple decisions. So um, in a nutshell, you know, that's kind of some of the differences, uh, some of the differences that we tried to make, some of the different avenues that we took from our recruitment approach for this program. Thank you, Katie. I think what, uh, what I'm also hearing with you and Deb in the programs is a lot of intentionality and going back to Tyler's comments about really thinking things through, design thinking has a framework that helps us do that and intentionality is, is a big part of it. So thank you for sharing that background. So, so far we've heard about two programs that recruit and train individuals for work in the mainframe. However, Melissa, you lead IBM's HyperProtect Accelerator, which is a new startup program designed to recruit global companies who are new and building the next gen of FinTech and health tech. How diverse are your accelerator cohorts and what role, if any, has innovation played in building a diverse startup, startup ecosystem in your program? Well, I, I want to first say that I'm so excited that I'm, I'm joining a panel talking about design thinking. Um, tomorrow I'm giving a talk for um, a number of students. Thank you, Tyler, because I'm stealing a lot of content from you. And you've given me a lot of talking points for um, something that's happening tomorrow with a, a whole crew of young people in South Africa who have asked these very, very same questions that we're all asking today. So as I'm sitting here listening to what everyone is saying and also thinking about what I want to say, I think it's also helping me, um, you know, continue to craft the message that I'm going to deliver tomorrow. But enough about that. Um, I run a program at IBM that's called the IBM HyperProtect Accelerator, and it's all about working with early stage entrepreneurs. And I'll tell you last year, um, our uh, application pool uh, when it came to diversity was uh, less than stellar. Dismal might be the word. Um, I, I might get in trouble for saying dismal, but it was dismal. And, you know, I was gutted because, you know, for me, I'm very passionate about um, making sure that we are, you know, diverse as a team. We're um, representative, you know, we represent our customers when I think about my team. And then when I also looked at uh, the startups applying to the program and, you know, my first day of doing interviews, I um, got through the entire day and it was 30 minute meeting after 30 minute meeting after 30 minute meeting. And I was gutted. And at the end of the meeting, um, one of my colleagues said, so how do you think today went? Like a lot of great innovative solutions. I won't use the exact words um, because I might get fired and Lisa might not allow me to come back again. So I'll, I'll, use a, I'll use a less colorful version of what I said, but it was like, we failed. And they're like, what happened? What did, what did we miss? And um, there were no women and there were no people of color. And I, I, I felt gutted. I felt depressed. I felt like, what did I do wrong? What did we do wrong? And I thought, okay, let's, you know, hopefully tomorrow is, uh, is going to be a better day. And, you know, we did have, you know, some, uh, some diverse candidates come through and not as many as I would like. Um, after the um, uh, kind of our one week accelerator, which is part of our program, I had a picture of everyone and I looked at it and it was me and um, my boss and a few other people and a few founders, but 
you know, it was primarily a certain gender. It was primarily a certain color, a certain background. And, you know, I debated about whether I should just throw the picture away and not show it to anyone. And I thought, no, 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 I need to, I need to show it and document that this is something that happened. This is a failure of ours, but we recognize it and let's do something to change that. And so thankfully I was able to um, get more budget, have more conversations, um, read more, talk to more people who, um, you know, are experienced in, um, recruiting uh, female founders and recruiting black founders, Latinx founders. And I, I changed some of my approaches and I had more people look at my application. I, you know, really deployed that concept of design thinking by saying, hey, can you look at this? Can you look at this? Am I saying, is it saying what I intend to say? And are there different approaches I should think about? We built a large database of, um, uh, VCs and other um, kind of interested parties that are working in this space and got the word out. Um, and we did a lot of talks, we wrote a lot of white papers, and I rolled up my sleeves and tried to do more uh, than I did last year. And I'm pleased to announce um, that we have more than uh, more than 50% of the 30 companies that were just announced last week at IBM Z Day have at least one female founder. Um, at least 30% of our, our founders have at least uh, one, uh, one black founder. And uh, the final number is 13% Latinx. Um, I will say we still have some room to grow when it comes to incorporating um, the Native American population. Uh, and one other thing I learned is I forgot to ask about veteran status. So again, I think it's one of those things where you fail, you learn from it, and you do better the next time. But I'm, I'm pleased to say that our cohort is now um, much more diverse, much more inclusive. Uh, we're going to start our mentorship journey in, uh, in November, and so everybody's just getting on board, but lots of learnings, and I'm sure um, we will continue to learn as we, you know, as we go along. Well, thank you, Melissa, and thank you for your candor, uh, learning from our experiences and uh, moving forward again with intentionality and some of those uh, principles from design thinking uh, can have a positive outcome on what we're trying to achieve. So congratulations. Thank you. I was really, you know, it was a really scary thing for me to talk about. You know, it's, it's hard to talk about, right? Like when you mess something up and you didn't mean to and you thought you did a great job and then you look at it and you're like, wow, I brought the numbers in, but E, you know, but, but I guess that's part of failing fast, recognizing it, figuring out where you need to know do better, talk to people who are in the know, and just learn as much as you can so that you can be the one to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in a position of power to be able to say, okay, how can I help other people who need to also be in a position of power? Well, and I think Tyler also mentioned about not falling in love with our designs, products, services, processes, being willing to go back. And Dr. Uh, Chance mentioned having the data so that we can move forward positively. So I'd, I'd like to, with that background, go back to you, Tyler. Uh, any method or process has its challenge oh, yeah. uh, and challenges. And are there any areas of caution with design thinking that we should be aware of and plan for in building diversity and inclusion initiatives? Yeah, definitely. Um, any method, obviously, like you said, has its challenges. And I, I said it before, but design thinking is about co-creation. And we've all been saying it when you're, you're making things, when you're co-creating, you have to make sure you're really purposeful of who you're doing your co-creation with, who you're doing your research with, because, um, you know, it's all about the data, um, getting, you know, diverse data points that reflect the world around you and making sure that the folks that you're working with, the folks you're doing research with um, are really reflective of your user base and, you know, who you're trying to attract. And there's a huge, huge potential for bias in all of our data. Um, and so it's really easy to like do research with the people in your bubble. Um, I know for me, like when I'm doing research with users, of, like just mainframe users, I, I go to the same like 15 people because I'm like, I know you, I love you, like, let's go. Um, but I'm not just designing for those people. You're not just designing for the people in your network, not just people that you're friends with. And it's really important for all of us to kind of pop our bubble and be purposeful about the data that we're gathering. 
So quick anecdote. Um, I just last week, um, so this is timely, but I just last week had a user research session about a new product I'm working on. And it was literally the first time I had ever talked to a black mainframe user. I know that they exist. I know that they are out there in the world. I've seen them with my eyes. So it just points to the fact that all this research that I'm doing is, it's biased. And all the research that my colleagues are doing is biased. It's biased toward, you know, biased away from the black mainframer experience. So again, purposeful. I need to change the way that I'm doing things so that the work that I'm doing isn't skewed toward the white mainframer experience, just as we don't want it to be skewed toward the male experience or the veteran mainframer experience, because the workforce is changing. We need to, you know, you know, adjust the way that we're working. And we really need the work and the products and the offerings that we're making to reflect the world around us, not just the people that are in our network. So bias is something you really got to be aware of. Excellent points. Thank you so much, Tyler. Deb, let's hear more about the Vitality program at Broadcom. Your program enrollment is demographically more diverse compared to the mainframe workforce. What are you doing differently with the mainframe Vitality program that, that you think accounts for this? Well, one of the things that I want to just simply mention before I answer is, Katie, you and I need to talk. We have very, very similar programs, and I would love to share with you what we're doing, if you can apply it and learn from you as well. In particular, you talked about thinking differently. And that's exactly what we did. We challenged the norms, the norms of HR hiring practices where bots will eliminate a huge untapped talent pool that just simply get discarded and never reach a hiring manager. And we discovered through our practice of, of looking at this through a different lens and seeking character of the individual, looking at the unique qualities that are needed, dare I say grit. Grit is very, very present in people who are members of um, uh, underrepresented groups. They've fought, right, to harder than others to be represented and to achieve goals. And, and the proof is in the outcome of what we've accomplished in the past two years. So of this vitality program that we developed in partnership with our customers, the outcomes speak for themselves. 48% of our vitality residents today are people of color. 48, I had to repeat it. 31% of the participants in our program are women. And that to me is a huge statement about doing things differently and challenging the norms. And this is how we went about it. And I think that's an important part of this conversation is beyond the problem and even, even successful outcomes is what's the secret sauce? We also did not go into this thinking, oh, let's make a diversity program out of this. We didn't at all. It's because we changed the way we think about how we attract talent and looks for those unique qualities, intelligent people who have an affinity for solving problems. They um, may or may not have technical degrees. We have students of French, music degrees, a handful with associates, the majority have four-year degrees. Why? Because we know that our customers who will hire them into the job roles have that as a requirement, but they waive them if they see the quality of the person and the fact that they're trained in mainframe, which is one of the core tenets of this vitality program and Broadcom carrying the cost literally for a year in order for people to develop to be considered. It's, it's been really great, um, a really great experience and our customers are responding really, really well. I would say that when we look through this lens, we find women returning to the workforce after a break. They've got two degrees, right? A technical degree, they've got a master's degree, they've been out of the workforce, very difficult to get back in. But if you look in unique places, there are organizations that are actually seeking people to relaunch into their career out there and available for people to tap into. Um, you could also look 
from the veteran perspective, we have um, an air traffic control person who has a technical affinity, who is transitioning into um, civilian life and found a placement in um, the state of New Jersey, as an example, in their IT division running mainframe systems. I mean, the, 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 the connection in particular to government state and local agencies with veterans is huge, really a big deal. Um, and, and these are educated people who have life experiences, they're hungry, they're ready for a big commitment. And the relationship that we're building through our program, our program of education, mentorship, and on-site residency, similar to the apprentice um, uh, version that, that you mentioned um, exists at us in Sono, I think they actually see a career, they feel a career, and they feel so supportive. We've got full buy-in across the board because of those activities and just challenging the norms and questioning the way we do things and finding ways around the bots. That's how we're bringing this much diversity into this vitality program. Thank you for the details, Deb, and congratulations also on the intentionality that's resulted in increased diversity even beyond what we see in the mainframe space in general. So it's a great uh, benchmark for everybody to shoot for and learn from each other. I love that hopefully you and Tyler can connect as well and seeing the uh, collaboration happening already here. Um, Dr. Chance, let's go back to you. Based on your experience as a black woman who rose to the C-suite as CIO, and one of the first black women to run a digital business in banking, your work now as an expert in creativity, you have a unique perspective to share with the audience and with us. What is the shift we must make in how we see and approach solutions if we want to accelerate diversity? Yeah, you know, Lisa, I represent um, the, the, group, the group of people that you guys are talking about when you speak about because you know I'm a woman, I'm black, um, I grew up in one of the worst neighborhoods in Brooklyn, and um, I was the first to graduate from college. And so obviously growing up in corporate America for so many reasons it was a big challenge. But what helped was that I knew myself. And while I, I think all of the programs, training, and everything that we can envision as organizations are great, I think we have to realize that I think it was uh, someone mentioned this thing about grit. And because when you grow up in neighborhoods and you are undervalued, and let's just be honest, you're undervalued, um, and, and you have to have a huge amount of confidence and understanding of yourself, I just want to caution people that when you engage, for example, small businesses and startups, who I work with often, there's a big gap because they also have gone through, so they're trying to be a business person without confidence, without necessarily understanding business, and so retention becomes a problem. So people who have grit also have trauma, uh, uh, and that's in the research, a tremendous amount of trauma. So if you build these programs and you don't build the psychological, psychological and emotional support within the programs, people will fail. You'll get the numbers in, but at the end of the day, you won't retain them because you don't have the systems to support the things that have been done in the past. So I really just want to mention that. And one of the things when I talk about my experiences is, is in my research, one of the biggest technologies that we have is our brain. And while we speak of design thinking, which I'm a fan of also, there is another thing called creative thinking. And the reason I like creative thinking is because changing thinking changes behavior. And when you change your behavior, you can change systems. Um, some of the processes that we traditionally use, they're temporary. You say, oh, I'm going to design something. Let me get the right people in the room. That's important. But if we want long-term impact, we have to change behavior by changing thinking. And the brain as a technology is, is like any muscle. You know, you have to work it, you have to expand it. And so this concept of expanding our creative thinking is about using the right side of our brain. Yeah, just like the mainframe, the right side of the brain is still a thing, right? And the right side of the brain is becoming really important now because the, the left side talks about logical, analytical, all the things we do to code and develop systems. But the right side is where we have empathy, meaning, emotion, creativity, imagination, and we only use less than 20% of that. 
So if we were to be trained to expand that, we would have more balanced systems, more balanced programs, approaches. We would actually rethink not just one piece, we would rethink the ecosystem. And I know that sounds like a huge big thing, but it is very important because we're talking about humanity. We really aren't talking about women, you know, any of that. We're talking about being human and how do we take so social justice and equality and make it something that we all care about because we all could be a victim in one way or another or our kids could be of this. So I would suggest um, three quick things um, is to ensure that you change yourself, that you do the work so that you can uh, change your behavior, get feedback from people that you trust about your behavior because the thing that we don't like and excuse me if I offend anyone is good white people. You know, people who have really good intentions, but they end up hurting us. And I'm speaking, you know, from that personally. Also, change up your leadership style toolkit. In the research, it says that we have, we go to one leadership style. Well, that's not creative or innovative at all. And it actually caused stagnation and we get in the way with the same uh, leadership style. And finally, hire anthropologists and psychologists because they actually can help you imp improve your thinking, look at behaviors that we're all blind to, and these professions can help you explore how do you build the communities and the leadership for real. This time, for once, one more time, let's do it right so that we don't have to keep coming back here having the same conversation. Well, uh I'm, um, I, I wish I could be taking more notes. I'm so glad this is being recorded. Uh, certainly what you're saying not only resonates from a research standpoint, Dr. Chance, but I can personally relate to it as well as a social science major with uh, over a dozen technology and software patents. Um, it's interesting to have a technology career with a liberal arts background. And I think it does bring some different skill sets. And we're hearing about broadening programs and broadening the candidacy pool. And uh, thank you for outlining the three creative ways that we can move forward as well. And Katie, let's dive in with that background a little bit more on your mainframe academy, because what Dr. Chance also brought up is that once candidates are selected into the program, what are some of the efforts made to retain those that aren't part of the quote unquote majority? And what are some of the challenges that you see them face? Absolutely. And Dr. Chance, man, she you put a lot of uh, <laughs> you put a lot of hard things on the table for us to think about. I mean, this is serious, and as she had mentioned before, the behavioral aspect of it—that is what changes outcomes, right? How you think it changes your behavior and it changes your actions at the end of the day. Um, and I completely agree in that. So to go back to one of our previous classes uh, within the mainframe apprenticeship, uh, it consisted of about 90% all white male. Uh, no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, one of the first individuals that opened the door for me to excel in my career was a white male. So very appreciative of this group of individuals. Uh, but as we know, again, it is limiting our view uh, of how, how we can better contribute and add value to our processes in our company. So, you know, I am very excited to say that just on those changes I talked about earlier, we were able to introduce at least 40% uh, people of color and 30% female into our most recent incoming class. So we were really excited about that. But in doing so, as Dr. Chance mentioned, it doesn't stop there. There's another element to developing this program. And I would say one of the, a few of the things that I really put a lot of emphasis on as a manager is my open door policy, trying to let any and everyone know on my team that I lead or that I don't lead, uh, I'm here to talk. Uh, many times, you know, as you mentioned, you have this leadership style and, you know, many leaders will put a wall up and kind of limit the, their, themselves in regards to engagement. Uh, I try my best to avoid building that wall. Uh, encouragement, uh, acknowledgement of achievements, ideas, your efforts. Um, just ensuring that individuals are aware of the value that they bring to the company and attempting to expose a potential that they may not see in themselves. Someone did that for me when I was uh, a young professional. They saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And so I feel like that's ultimately our calling as leaders in general, right? To bring out the best 
and uh, people that uh, we work with and that work for us. Um, while I consciously would seek to do this with any and everyone on my team, it is evident that some may require this a bit more than others, right? Some may feel as if though they are, you know, outliners and they need to be encouraged and told that they do bring value and they are doing an awesome job. Um, I really can't move on from this without also talking about constructive criticism. That is a very important part in this and everyone doesn't always swallow that pill very well. And, uh, but at the end of the day, I try to emphasize how understanding something better and change brings about growth, not shame. Right? It brings about an opportunity to make you a better you and not necessarily uh, a situation in which it's condemning. Um, so I, I put emphasis on all those aspects when I take a look at those who may not be a part of the majority, if you will. Um, some of the challenges you had asked, what was some of the challenges? Uh, some of the challenges that I often see, again, is just feeling like outlanders, uh, feeling as if though that... Um, it's just like this typical feeling of exclusion, right? Oh, I don't have a four-year degree, so, you know, I may not be doing as well in this area as another person, even though they may clearly outperform their peers. I mean, it's evident to everyone around them, but they have this little, you know, demon in their head telling them, I'm not worthy. I don't add up. I don't, I'm not adequate. So as leaders, I think it's important to continually reiterate to them that you are. Uh, giving them pats on the back so you know because that lack of confidence ultimately kind of results in their productivity right even though they have it inside of them it's that little person in their head that may be telling them that they don't um we do a lot of lessons learned and evaluations at the end of the program what can i do better what did you see here right that you felt like could have been done differently uh, that would have contributed to you specifically we're talking about you not everyone else in the program so we try to take those lessons learned and add them back in. Um, we currently have an Insonos Women Connected. I'm a regional leader here, and it's a program that we have uh, several activities across the globe, uh, across our offices, and it just emphasized, uh, uh, you know, the inclusion of the woman. Um, you know, just it's just a way to kind of bring a, a brighter look to gender differences on a positive know you know putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that I am not a man I am a woman that's fantastic that's awesome I have differences there's nothing wrong with those differences they make me wonderful they make me valuable just as yours uh, may do the same for you so uh, we really push that um, um, uh, throughout the company and so that's just one of the activities just one of the ways that we try and uh, encourage that inclusivity mm -hmm. well thank you Katie and thank you for sharing with us, it's more than just identifying individuals, it's more than just bringing them into a program. Many of you have been talking about the whole ecosystem itself of the process and, and uh, retention is a part of that feeling truly like inclusion. There's a, there's a term diversity and then a term inclusion and they work together. And I think we're talking about both here in this conversation for sure. Um, we have been talking um, just to these recent questions regarding individuals and Melissa, as we've learned, you evaluate whole companies, not just individuals, for acceptance into an accelerator program. And this is different than recruiting individuals or promoting diversity internally, uh, as you evaluate whole management teams. Why is diversity in the management team of the company important to you and your program? I think it goes back to that concept of if you are, you know, uh, in a role where you're responsible for, you know, creating products, creating solutions, you know, identifying, um, you know, wicked problems in the world, let's say. If you're not diverse as a team, as a management team, you're not going to be reflective of your audience. And so it's going to be very difficult for you to really fulfill their needs and really understand their pain points. You know, it's just like as much as much time as I may spend with, you know, a, a black woman, a white man, a Native American. I, I don't I didn't grow up in 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 whatever he she they grew up in. And so my my thoughts are going to be different. The way I look at things are going to be different. Like I can ask a million questions and I can start to understand and I can try to understand and I can empathize or try to. At the end of the day, I'm never going to um, I'm never going to be 
that individual. And so I think when we have a diverse and inclusive team, whether that, and, and I'm not, I'm also not saying that it should be like an all female team. I, I believe it should be a combination of men and women in different age groups and different ethnicities and backgrounds and experience levels and abilities so that we can, you know, again, truly think about how do we create the right products and services. Um, I'm going to flip things a little bit and share something related yet different. Um, I spend a lot of my, my time also um, empowering students through mainframe skills. And I saw one of the questions that popped up and I've been itching to, to say something about it. And I think we should also really think about, you know, what are, what are these stereotypes that exist out there when it comes to education, whether that's going into the big bad mainframe world. Yes, it still exists. Yes, it's still a thing. Come and talk to me. I'll give you my Twitter handle. We can talk more, you know, in more, more detail. It's Mentor Africa with a K. So whoever that anonymous person is who asked the question, hit me up. I'd be glad to talk to you in more detail about why uh, the mainframe still exists. You know, if you think about all of the different, um, you know, banks and all the different transactions on the planet, one of the wonderful things is if your friends aren't going there, you have a wealth of opportunities that they're not kicking you and fighting over. There you go. Um, but I work with a lot of students and they, they say a lot of these same kinds of things. You know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm a woman in tech. I want to be a woman in tech. And I walk in the room and there are only boys in the coding camp. Or, you know, how do, I, how do I walk in the room and feel like I belong? And I think this is a challenge that we don't just face, you know, in our careers in the, you know, kind of stage in which we're in. This is something that's happening very, 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 very young, where even young people are not necessarily being exposed to computer science early enough. Um, that is leading them to not even think about going into careers that, invo that involve you know, coding or programming or data science. And so I not only try to look at companies and diversity and inclusion from a, you know, um, a founder's perspective, but I really try to hit you know, hit it early and think about what is it that I can individually do at the, you know, at the age of 9, 10, 11, 13, 16, so that young people really feel like I own a seat at that table. And if I walk in the room and they're only boys or a different color than me or a different nationality than me or they're speaking a different language than me, how is it that I can come in the room and own my seat at the table? Because I, I'm sure many of you are, have been in positions where you're the only woman in the room. And so I've personally learned how to adapt to that. You know, is it always how I want it to be? Not necessarily. Do I try my best to bring in, you know, diversity inclusion? Yes, but I, I also know that, hey, it's not always going to happen. Well, thank you, Melissa. And also thank you for taking a stab at that question. For anyone who uh, asks, asks questions and we might run out of time, to answer them, we will be retaining them and reach out to you individually. So feel free to continue to ask questions. Also, just a technical note, since we did get a late start, we had technical challenges starting, we're going to continue our conversation. If you need to jump off to join another session, feel free to, to do that. This is being recorded. And so we're just going to continue to work through the questions with our wonderful panelists. Um, and so let's go to um, Deb. Thank you again, Melissa. But Deb, can you tell us how you suggest we break more, in your opinion, more gender and racial barriers? Happy to. So first of all, I agree with um, the panelists here. A tremendous, tremendously valuable set of um, examples and guidance. I would, I would turn a little bit um, uh, of what Melissa said on its head with regard to the top of the business. I wouldn't look up only to your senior leaders to, quote, bring programs forward. I think it's most important and most critical for us to look in the mirror, right? Be open, be present, and be unafraid. I think that last word, being unafraid, is the thing that actually will change the future dynamics when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And it's critically important that we become the community. We are the community. You're doing it right now, Lisa, by organizing this topic and bringing us all together. We're creating this community. We're talking about it openly. Not an easy thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. Our diversity exists and it needs to be seen and heard for it to grow. 
and for others to learn from us. So be an ambassador. Use social media much more often than you do to talk about topics of uh, diversity and inclusion. Utilize mentors around you and motivate the senior folks within your team who may not be managers, but are huge influencers who can mentor others and, and, and expect, hold them accountable to embrace that and to act on it. So I believe that we in our behaviors and, and being unafraid, we motivate. And I'm really proud of this panel and all the things that we're all doing actively today to make that possible. So don't look up, look in the mirror, look to your left, look to your right. This is the community and we need to advocate, be the voice, get out there on social media, get people of color, women, um, people of other, and get them blogging. If they don't know how to blog, show them or get somebody who knows how and, and get that, that voice heard. So diversity is seen and perpetuated. Mm -hmm. uh, th thank you for your passion with that. Um, it's uh, something that I'm hearing you say, Deb, is community. We're, we're in community, behave as if we're in community, and then also broaden our community, uh, starting from ourselves, our own individual uh, responsibilities and commitment. So um, let's also then turn to you, Dr. Chance, springboarding from what Deb is saying about community. You created a diversity program called A Walk in My Shoes to increase personal awareness and action around diversity. What is the role of white men in this work and, why do you, and what do you see as the opportunity for the mainframe community and others when white men are more involved in the arena of inclusion since we are talking about a broad community? For sure, Lisa. I developed a walk in my shoes program because I didn't want to explain my challenges anymore. I wanted to have a vehicle for others to experience what it feels like to be a person who's marginalized. So I wanted people to see, feel, and walk in the shoes of others from a different perspective. And the program's multimodal, combining technology, art, history, and performance, and it takes you back in time. So there is a way to get pretty close mentally to walk in someone else's shoes. And it does, to your point, Lisa, it changes people individually because we have to start at the individual level. And so for white men who just as Katie referenced, um, gave me my first shot and gave me many shots at, at opportunities to grow and to excel in my career over time. And so what I want more than anything is to have white men show up um, not just the, to what Deb was saying, and not just the CEO or the senior leaders, because, you know, just as black women or other people get a bad rap, today we know that white men are, you know, the, the reputation, some of the things in the news, you're getting killed because it looks like, you know, you're the bad guy with all the power. And those of us who work in the mainframe and other industries, we know this is not true. We know that there are a lot of people and white men who stand up and show up and support. And we need to know that more. We need to see that more. And so the way that you can do that is, number one, be the only man in the room. Go to events that make you uncomfortable so you can see what it feels like to be the only person in the room that looks like you. Um, also, um, uh, work on personal action and awareness. Learn in real life. I know there's stuff going around about read these books and read these articles. That's important, but I work in experiential work, which means you learn by doing. So what I'd like you to do is to create a daily conversation, even if it's just for a few minutes, with someone who doesn't live in your neighborhood, who doesn't look like you, like all these different ways of being diverse. Just figure it out. If you feel uncomfortable, if you look at something and go, I wonder, then take action. Also join a men's group with a facilitator who can help you talk through, maybe in a safer space, some of your concerns and to Deb's point, the things that you fear so that you can get the confidence and support that you need to kind of explore things that might make you uncomfortable. Also, um, review your social conditioning. 
in our minds and in our emotions, what I know as a psychologist is we have our ancestry and our belief systems and our society that impacts our social norms. And they are hidden from us. They actually show up as if they're, we're being controlled by a puppet master. So we become on automatic mode in our social conditioning. We have preconceived ideas. And as I mentioned earlier, it stagnates new thinking. So change this. Learn how to go out and, and, and ask for help to get that change to happen. And then reconsider if you own a group, your diversity training programs. I believe, because I grew up, I'm not going to say how many years ago, in diversity training programs that are still here. And because we're still having this problem, obviously they don't work or they didn't work as effectively. So work, challenge those things. Challenge the norms about what we talk about when we say diversity and inclusion and go towards experiential work that can help you learn faster and feel what it feels like. And finally, white women, educate your men and your children. This is about all of us. Just as black people have to educate their children, we need you to do the same. Let us learn how to learn from our history so that we do not repeat it and or become a casualty of it. That's what I, that's my hope. Well, thank you, Dr. Chance. Uh, once again, setting the bar high for all of us, but we know that we're on the path and individually uh, to your point and to Deb's point, we have the responsibility and the capability to do it and then organizationally as well. So let's switch now to talk about an organization and a personal question to Katie. Let's go back to you. Can you share with us what diversity means to InSono? What diversity means to Ensono, uh, I'll have a personal spin on this, so I'll kind of say, you know, my perspective and what I think the company's perspective is. Uh, I want to say heads off to Deb, though, something that you mentioned was about fear, and that is one of the biggest things we have to overcome. Uh, I completely agree with that, and I think that Ensono is making strides and actually uh, uh, achieving that goal. So I would say for Insono, you know, uh, diversity would mean embracing the uniqueness of uh, the talents and the skills, you know, embedded in all individuals and associates across our company and outside of it. Um, you know, it's our goal to kind of like perfect, purposefully seek um, an open mind to educate ourselves, as well as, uh, you know, to kind of talk about those conscious and subconscious biases out loud as opposed to just thinking them or kind of sitting in the background wondering if it's going to ever resolve itself. Uh, I think we consciously are aiming to do those things. Uh, that's a very critical aspect, I think, of our business, uh, our recruiting efforts, all the way to our uh, ideal acknowledgement, even through to our promotions, you know, wanting to take a step back. And I think we are looking closer at those type of things. Uh, you know, in order to truly be great and to progress in a way that exceeds expectations, um, it's, you know, imperative that we allow the world uh, uh, to see the IT needs from multiple eyes. Um, we cannot just see it one way. This is not a one-way street. Um, I'll kind of quote what our CEO, Jeff, has stated in the past. He said, diversity and inclusion enriches and strengthens all of us. And I think that kind of sums it up. It genuinely does. It impacts each and every individual in a positive way. Um, so I take pride in kind of what our company is doing. Uh, we are working every day to uh, become better at this, implementing new programs. And, uh, you know, in general, I think in Sono is definitely uh, uh, forging this effort and uh, trying to make our company as well as others uh, better in this area. Well, thank you, Katie, for, for both in Sono's perspective and your personal perspective, because it's also important that they uh, have a cross reference point and that way we can move forward as individuals within our organization. So thank you for that. And Melissa, if you're still, if you can still hear us. I am uh, still here. Great. I, I'm going to just throw you one more quick question. Just please give us the quick answer so we can um, so stay true to our time commitment here, but I want to give you the chance to tell us what role do you think people with non-technical backgrounds or non-traditional experience play in driving technological innovation and industry disruption? 
so, you know, speaking as someone who, um, you know, brings technology entrepreneurs and developers, you know, into the world of the mainframe as well as the public cloud, um, I can say that we belong and I'm an example. And I used to feel like an imposter. And I'd look around and I thought, wow, I've written one line of code in my life and it's hello world and I'm getting kicked out of here real soon. But I, I realized that, you know, we all have strengths, we all have weaknesses, and we all have different things that we bring to the table. And it takes a team of people, and that is experience as well. You can't run a company without, whether that's tech or non-tech, without many different types of backgrounds and experiences. And, you know, I think Tyler, if I'm not mistaken, you might have a non-traditional background too, but I may be mixing you up with someone else. And many of us have, you know, our different journeys. So um, don't think that you need to be a data scientist or a developer or programmer or know how to code to work in tech. There's a place for all of us. That said, if you're interested in, uh, in learning how to code and don't know where to start, Again, feel free to hit me up on Twitter, and I'm happy to give you some resources, and it's Mentor Africa with a K. Was that fast enough? I was trying. <laughs> All right, good. Thank you. I know you have a flight to catch, and we have one more question from Tyler to help us wrap up. Um, Tyler, in your view, what does design thinking really bring to the work around increasing the ranks of women, people of color, and other underrepresented groups to the mainframe ecosystem? Kind of what's your nugget for us to wrap up our conversation today? Okay, I will fly through it. I have my phone with a timer on, uh, so I, I'll know, I'll keep it short. Um, but basically, you know, we want to act with purpose and with empathy, like we've been saying for the whole talk, and really emphasizing the fact that you can't fall in love with the way things have always been done, because clearly they haven't really been working that great. Um, and, you know, you can't do the same thing over and over again and wonder why things aren't changing. So treat everything like a prototype. Um, my own team, so we have our IBM design studio in Poughkeepsie, New York. So um, my studio, we took a whole day off of work. We were like, all right, we, we need to address this problem of our own hiring practices for our own studio. And we had a full day design jam where we did some like rapid fire research um, to learn about like what our own studio was doing, what people across the industry were doing about their own like diversity and inclusion and empowerment practices. And like we did it because we knew we weren't doing enough. Um, but by doing the research, even if it was, it was really fast research, not even like a complete research project, but by just doing that research, we realized by how much we were really missing the mark. Um, in our own diversity inclusion practices and hiring practices. And so now our team is designing new ways to not only increase our own hiring of BIPOC uh, designers now, we're also designing new ways to increase the BIPOC uh, pipeline for our own hiring, like starting at, you know, high school, middle school, because, you know, we have the, we, you know, the pool is already small because the pipeline hasn't started yet. Um, and we need to, you know, start early. So I think that when you start co-creating and actually doing the research, you're going to shatter kind of your own glass and like pop your own bubble. And so really just you have to own your white guilt. Um, you know, if what Gloria said around good white people, if that made you uncomfortable, ask yourself why, give yourself a little like cry, own the guilt, just do it for a hot second and then do something about it educate yourself and then build a method with purpose and something that's going to work. And then you have to continuously validate it. You can't just put something out in the world and say, cool, I did it. The way we do design thinking at IBM has literally three steps. It's observe, reflect, and make. And we visualize it in an infinity loop. And you continuously just observe the world around you, reflect on what you made, and, you know, just keep going through that and doing research. So continually validate and invalidate and change things. And so I'll leave you with this one actionable thing that you can do today, super easy, is to join the Tech Can Do Better community. It is on Instagram. Basically, we are leveraging design thinking techniques um, and you know real world in, uh, research to promote and drive equitable hiring, promotions and compensation, investment in social equity, and advocacy for equitable legislation. So that is 
tech can do better. It's on Instagram. It's an amazing community. It's just starting up. Um, and I think tech really can do better and design thinking is a great way for us to do that. Well, thank you, Tyler, for wrapping us up so beautifully and really a heartfelt thank you to each of our incredible panelists. Each of you um, have given us all a lot to think about and more importantly, some actionable steps that we can each take in our own organizations, regardless of our industry. We value your candor and expertise in navigating this important discussion today. And personally, it's been an, an immense pleasure working with each of you. Thank you so much. Um, and at this point, I'd turn it over to Cher. And Amy, if you're still there, you can help us wrap up. Thank you so much. Again, this concludes our presentation. Thank you to everyone for attending. And please take a moment to complete the quick feedback survey on your screen. We really appreciate your input. Again, this presentation will be available on the SHARE website in the content center. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for our great speaker to share their expertise. Have a lovely day, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. To you. Bye.